and get started. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, our first webinar of the new year. Um, I'd like to remind everyone in attendance that we will be recording this webinar today. All recordings will be posted on YouTube within 24 to 48 hours. If you have any questions, please feel free to type those questions in the chat or in the Q&A. If you use the chat, please make sure you use you change that little blue drop down menu so it reads everyone and not just hosts and panelists. That way we can all read your questions and benefit from the responses. Um, those of you attending today in uh, live uh, will uh, be eligible for uh, Illinois professional development credit um, after the uh, webinar ends today. Uh, we will send out those emails in also about 24 to 48 hours as well. Uh, my name is Matt Jacobson. I am the online learning coordinator for the Learning Technology Center of Illinois. And today uh, we are going to be starting something a little bit different from uh, the way we've run our uh, webinars in the past. Uh, in January, we will be doing a series of three webinars on student engagement. Um, now, we've all just had a bit of a break here in, uh, in the wintertime, and it's hard for us as adults to kind of get back uh, into the swing of doing school again. So we can all imagine how difficult it must be for the students in our classrooms as well. Uh, so today I have invited uh, some of our LTC instructional technology coaches to uh, uh, sort of participate in a panel discussion uh, surrounding the topic, the essential question, uh, if you will, um, how can educators keep students engaged with meaningful technology integration? We're joined today by uh, our coaches, uh, Patricia Ferris, Emily Poole, and Kevin Shouten. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I am going to let you folks introduce yourselves and sort of uh, kind of take things away on your own. So uh, coaches, it's all yours. Well, this is always the tricky part. Who goes first? You have that awkward pause as you wait for somebody to talk over somebody else on the uh, on the call, but I'll go ahead and jump in. Hi, my name is Emily Poole, and I am a coach in uh, Western Central Illinois, so that's Adams Pike County area, uh, right next to uh, Missouri. And I, this is my first year being a coach, but prior to this, my experience has been uh, teaching third grade and just kind of supporting teachers uh, in my schools before that. Um, so, uh, Kevin, I'll hand it to you to introduce yourself next. Hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Scouten. I am also a first year instructional technology coach with the LTC. Uh, prior to being a technology coach here, um, I spent uh, almost 30 years in the classroom and um, as a, a school administrator throughout the, uh, the southern suburb area, uh, currently working as a technology coach in the South Cook um, region. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Patricia Ferris. I'm also an instructional technology coach first year with LTC. And um, in the past, I have uh, worked for almost 10 years as an instructional coach, literacy coach. Um, and I work with uh, the South Cook in the South Cook region with two special education cooperatives. Great. Okay, well, uh... I guess we're going to go ahead and just jump in and kind of share this. Um, Kevin, you're kind of on there first. If you want to share some years first, or absolutely, whatever, if you want to. All right. So um, one of the things that I like to do with uh, with technology in the classroom uh, is give students choice. Uh, and one of the things that I've found that really drives engagement for students is is that they have some ownership in what they are creating. And so I can give you a uh, an example. Um, when I was a classroom teacher, I started a project many, many years ago where I had my students um, kind of reflect on Fridays. I called it Friday Reflections. It's basically like a journaling activity. Um, and what I noticed, any of you that are um, our language arts teachers or work with, with student writing, um, not everybody likes to write. 
And so there were a lot of students that, you know, we'd get to the end of the, the week and I'd have them writing out, uh, you know, something that they, uh, they wanted to re reflect on for the week. And I'd have those students that would write very easily. I had students that would write because I told them to and they were compliant. And then I had those students that um, just hated it uh, because writing wasn't their thing. And so I was thinking about what my goal was, what my end goal was with that, uh, with that activity. And it really wasn't the, the product itself. And so I started to think about ways that I could use technology to achieve the same goal, but um, give students a, an opportunity to respond differently. So I, I transitioned from that, just having them journal to doing something where I gave them an opportunity to choose between blogging, podcasting, or video production. And so the, the goal was the same. I still asked the students each week to choose something that they wanted to reflect on, but then I gave them the opportunity to choose the tool that they wanted to use to, uh, to provide me with that, with that feedback. And so uh, I noticed right away that the students um, were way more engaged because they were able to pick something that fit them personally. You know, we all know that there are people, I'm, I'm a writer, I like to write. Um, and so if I were given the choice, I would choose creating a blog. Um, but there are students who love to, to be in front of a camera and they love to be the center of attention. And so they would choose the video, um, the video side of things. Or um, there are those students who like to talk, but they're scared to death to be in front of a camera. And so they would go with the podcasting option. And so I noticed that not only did it really um, increase engagement with the students in that one specific uh, uh, project. But what I noticed as a result of that is I started having students come to me throughout the, throughout the day, throughout the, the week, when I would give them an assignment to work on, I would have students come to me and say, hey, can I do this in a video instead? Or can I add this to my podcast? And so they really, once they had that, that option to choose something that really fit with what they wanted to, to create, then it was, uh, it was way less difficult for me to get the information out of them because they were doing it in such a way that they found entertaining and exciting. It even got to the point where we started talking about monetization. The students were like, well, hey, I got this podcast going. I've got 15 podcast episodes. How do, I, how do I make money off of this? And so obviously I told them, no, you can't do that in school. But I, um, we, it led to a whole, uh, a whole discussion that we had, a whole, basically a whole unit that we ended up creating on um, YouTube and podcasts and how to monetize and how to make a business out of, out of creating YouTube. And that all just came from the idea that, you know, uh, just giving them some choice in terms of how to respond. And so um, that would be my, my main suggestion for how to keep kids engaged is to look at what your goal is in terms of the information that you want the students to be able to, to convey or, or give back to you and look at ways that you can use technology to give them the means to be creative in a way that fits their, their personal style. And so as far as, as basic tools go, um, I'm sure you all know Flipgrid. Uh, when it comes to video production, Flipgrid is definitely what I, what I used because it was, it's very simple. Um, you know, kids can jump right into it and they don't have to do a bunch of, uh, of learning to use Flipgrid. One of the nice things that I like about Flipgrid is, is that you can moderate the videos so they don't immediately get published out to the rest of the group unless you see them first. Um, for podcasting, what I used was anchor.fm. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it is a free podcasting tool. You don't have to, and it's free. It's not one of those where it's free unless you want to do anything with it and then you have to spend more money. It's actually free. Um, and it comes with uh, sound clips and intro and outro music so students can actually create a pretty professionally sounding uh, podcast and they can create a, a series of them that way. Um, for blogging, because of just ease of use, I was in a Google district, so we ended up using the blogger um, uh, tool that Google puts out. Nice that it integrates with Google Classroom and everything, so we're able to use that. But um, I know that there are other video um, video based tools out there. There are other podcasting um, sites that you can use, but those were the three that I landed on because mostly they were very simple to use. I didn't have to spend a lot of time teaching the students how to use the, the tool. I was able to just hand them the tool and they were, to use, they were able to use it to create what they wanted to create. So um, those three little tools, hopefully uh, you got a little bit of something out of that. And the main idea there is just to be able to give them the choice to create something using technology that they're proud of.
Well, thanks for that, Kevin. We appreciate it. Um, let's see, Patricia, do you have some ideas on uh, how you might re-engage students after a long break or keep students engaged in learning? Yes, so one of the things that I discovered last year after attending a webinar, and I think it was actually um, the LTC remote learning webinar last January, um, that I found was Jamboard. I know it's been around for a while, but I really fell in love with it at, because of, like Kevin said, the ease of uh, using Jamboard and quick, uh, quick, not much learning involved with that, right? Like you said, with Flipgrid. Um, and I love it because you can use it as a collaborative tool for students um, and also you can assign things so that students can work on one slide or one frame, or they can you can assign individual frames and with their names on it, or you can assign group work. So I'm going to share um, the, a quick little Jamboard presentation that I made, um, and it has some QR codes at the end of the frame to um, go on and find more resources. So let me share my screen and. Um, just quickly here, I'll just share. And what is Jamboard? I just put in all, I added all the things that Jamboard can do. So um, you can you can add photos and images, create your own background um, from, and I like to create the backgrounds from like Canva or Google Slide or Google Draw, and then upload the different backgrounds that um, we can use as a template. Um, it's a, basically a whiteboard, right? You can use it during your Google Meet and pull it up right away. You can add sticky notes, drawing. One thing I just, I downloaded it on the iPad and I love, so for our younger students, it has that automatic draw or, you know, what are you trying to draw? Because I'm not a good artist. So I just, you know, draw, drew to a circle and two pointy ears and it said, hey, here's like 20 choices you can select from. So the iPad is pretty cool. Um, you can brainstorm with it. Like I said, use it as a collaborative tool. Um, use one frame to model learning and then collaborate as a group. Um, and I really like the new version history that you can see what students have been on there, what, what they did inside Jamboard as well. Um, and then add shapes. And um, one thing that I remember going into, I co-taught co a class um, virtually last year during our COVID time, remote learning. And um, I wanted groups of students to work. So as they went into breakout rooms, I had a sticky note that um, I had the student names on, on each frame. And then I just love the fact that we could see what they were doing, even though I wasn't in the same room with them. Um, I could see everybody working collaboratively on the board. So as you go through, um, why would we use Jamboard? There's so many ways to engage students in learning using Jamboard. And here's just not all, but a lot of ways. Um, as far as like exit tickets, gallery walks, you know, students can create individual frames and then students can look at each other's frames and provide peer feedback. Um, that's another thing I love about this is that you can provide feedback instantly on a sticky note. You know, if students are working individually or independently on each frame, you can pop in and leave a st sticky note feedback for the students and um, students can leave feedback for each other. So here's just some examples of how you can use Jamboard. There's so many. I really love this one. This is from the New York Times um, that you, they have a, a weekly what's going on in this picture without a caption. And it's great for the notice and wonders um, and critical thinking, visual thinking strategies. Here's a different one where you could do a labeling and, and compare for some cell structures, another one that you can work independently here. So I like to also create, like if I'm creating this on the Jamboard, I can download it as an image here and then upload it back up as a, as a uh, background so that students not, are not moving this around, the pictures around. So that was another really fun part. Um, and I work with teachers uh, with special needs students. So they have told me that they like they prefer using Jamboard over Google Slides because they do a lot of drag and drop um, activities, and they find that with Google uh, Slides that it's all it's sometimes difficult for students to grab that item and drag it over even if it's with their finger or their mouse. But with Jamboard, they don't resize it; it's easy to manipulate on the board. Um, here's a writing template I grabbed from Alice Keeler. Um, number of the day where the students will fill in all this in information. So I'm not going to go through all of those. You, you know, feel free to grab that link and go through those later. I use this for um, 
adult professional learning. They just loved this part last year. Um, you know, it's a nice way just to kind of breathe and relax and just kind of allow, you know, us to be, just say how we're feeling at the end of the day. <laughs> and I do use Jamboard every time I'm right now, I'm providing professional development for champs behavior or classroom management. So it's a great way for teachers to feel like they're part of the conversation without feeling vulnerable um, to add their name because they can just add uh, notes and thoughts without having their name on there. And on this frame, just a quick cheat sheet of what all the icons mean and what you can do with it. And the last frame has some QR codes for different resources that I found. Of course, there's so many Jamboards out there. One thing I really like is to look at this Facebook teachers using Jamboards because there's uh, just a variety of Jamboards for a variety of all grades, pre-K to adult transition, and they all love to share. So they, I just grab those and um, make a copy and use them and use them with teachers. Thanks for letting me share. All right, so since there's three of us, I guess that means I'm next. All right, I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, I kind of took mine in a little different way and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen also. Let's see if I can get this up here. Is when I was thinking about ways to uh, engage um, students, I thought about two different things that I do to kind of engage them and that's like, having a visual path for students so they know where they're going and then also really thinking about the goals that um the goals that they're trying to achieve and where they're going with that and then i kind of tied some tech tools into this as we go uh one of my favorite tech tools uh, that i use all the time to create some of these simple drawings is not only being able to include the uh Google pictures on there, but also flat icon. If you're not familiar with that, that's a great way to get really simple pictures to make your um, your presentations clean and crisp. Uh, my background is elementary, so we try to keep it really simple uh, so that we don't overwhelm them too much. All right. Um, so the first thing when I'm thinking about engaging students, a big piece for me is to make sure that their learning path is visible. And so using technology, I can do that more easily. I didn't always have um, a million square miles of bulletin board space, nor did I want all of that stuff on the walls. So using something uh, like this, where you have a little game board and showing kids where we're going along the path and where they are, um, in their own path can be great. Um, this is a template from Paula at Slides Mania. If you haven't been to Slides Mania yet, uh, she's amazing with the things that she shares. Uh, but that's a great way to see where they are in a path as you're working through things. Uh, and then this third one, this picture down here at the bottom is a classroom teacher that I worked with and she had this spooky, uh, the pumpkins traveled along the goal and you can't see in the little gray boxes, but inside of those little gray boxes, she has uh, all of the little um, quick little notes about what the students are going to be doing at that time. And it was self-paced and directed, but the students were able to see their learning path. It always reminds me of uh, showing up to staff meetings and there were staff meetings where you received the agenda and you knew the things that were going to happen and how they were going to go on uh, versus those staff meetings where you showed up and you had no idea where you were going or how it was, when you were going to end or the things that you were going to do. And I think just like uh, we feel when we know where the path is clear, uh, that helps students to engage as they're going along too. Uh, so there's that. Here's a couple of things that I Oh, let's see. Um, used in order to make those paths a little bit clearer using technology that I could share through my Google Classroom. I am a Seesaw certified educator, so I do a lot or have done a lot with Seesaw as well on these. But uh, in a Google Doc or even in your Google Classroom, for older kids, they can probably handle having uh, quite a few things in their Google classroom so that they know where they're going in that lesson that they're working on. Uh, over here, this was in a writing unit that we did. On the very last slide, the students had all of the target points that they were going for. And so as they worked, they were engaged because they knew what was next and they knew how they were going with it, including the feedback that I would include 
as we were working through their projects. Um, another favorite of mine, and as uh, Matt and I were talking right before the webinar started, I, who doesn't love a good spreadsheet? I, I mean, a spreadsheet can do everything, and I just find them amazing. I realize sometimes I might be in the minority on how much I nerd out on spreadsheets, but that's okay. Uh, one way that I was able to use these is to be able to have my objectives or the skills going across the top. And in our classroom, we used a system of four, three, two, one, meaning four, you're doing great. One, you've started it, but you're not quite there yet. Uh, those were really meaningful to the kids and watching the colors and getting them engaged with where they needed to go next. And very easily, I could keep track on my computer in, in my spreadsheet, keep track of where they are and where they were going, and then share that to the students as viewers so that they could see it as well. Now, in this example, I have all of the students on there. There are ways to make it so that they're only seeing um, their own name by sharing it out to different tabs. But just in that example, uh, we did that. We've also used graphing before, which is a great way to engage them in the idea of growth and how they're growing and changing with their learning. Um, also, I, again, as a big proponent of Seesaw, we use that. I would include when we did some of our bigger projects, we did a poetry collection and uh, having that page or a slide for the students to be able to check off where they were going and what pieces they had in there, I think is really important to engaging them. Again, making that path clear so they know where they're going. Uh, Seesaw also has a whole, if you are interested in exploring a whole big section about uh, the skills tracking that they have if you're Seesaw for Schools or if you're Seesaw Ambassador, so students and teacher, teachers can track how students are doing with their skills. Um, and again, for me, that just goes back to knowing where I'm going is engaging uh, and having the kids be clear on that as well. Uh, I also included on here flippity.net. And flippity.net, this is just one piece that they have on the tools that you can use on flippity, but flippity has a couple of different progress trackers on there that are just kind of fun and neat ways to engage kids again connecting them back to where are we going and how close are we to meeting that success criteria. Uh, the other piece I said was having goals and so. Starting off the new year, we all talk about having our, you know, our New Year's resolutions and, oh, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Um, a few years ago, I had a coach that I had worked with and she shared with us the one word and I'll, I'll just give it kind of briefly, but you can definitely YouTube the one word and there's a lot of things out there. But instead of, you know, picking these long goals for everything you're doing and, you know, setting goals in all these different areas, pick one word. What's one word that can apply to multiple places in your life and really make that uh, be your focus on how you're working? And so what I would do with my students, and I'll show you on the next slide here, is we would talk about this idea of the one word and I would pull up some of the great videos that I found on YouTube, which you can search and find as well. Um, and it would talk about the power of the one word. Um, couple years ago, my word was progress. And so in everything I did, I wanted to make sure that I was trying to, you know, have progress. What was my next step and how could I improve? Uh, last year, my word was listen. And I wanted to make sure that I wasn't always the one talking, but instead also listening to my students, to my family, uh, to the world around me, rather than always being someone with an answer. Um, and so we took some time with my students and we thought about these different words and then we illustrated them and we made them very visual uh, pieces in our hallway, at our desk, on our Google, you know, in our Google verse and all of those kind of things so that we were constantly reminding ourselves of where we wanted to go and how we wanted to make that improvement. So. Uh, I do not have examples of exactly what we did last year. I didn't know I'd be sharing those kind of things, but I had a teacher friend, my student teacher is doing it. Here's some of her kids. They came up with their words for this year. And what we did last year is the kids took themselves, they took a picture and they gave themselves a fun background. And then at the bottom, they would write their word. After their one word, they would then think about, okay, in different aspects of my life, what does it look like if this is my word? How am I going to grow and, you know, become better through that? And we would constantly uh, share that 
oh, I'm working towards my one word or, you know, and we kept it very visual for all of the class to see. Uh, we did a shared Google Doc also where uh, each of the students wrote down their words and other students chimed in ways that they thought they could help each other to achieve that word or how they could be a good classmate in supporting that friend with that goal. Um, this was a flip book that we created. This was kind of my my Google slide takeover of it, but we actually did a little flip book that went right below the picture and they could flip up with strategies that they would use to uh, meet their one goal and uh, what would it look like for them as they were reaching for their goal. So for me, I think students can become engaged. There's lots of neat tech tools and you can do a little of this, a little of that, but having that focus and path, I think is really important to uh, keeping them engaged on knowing where to go. Thanks, Emily. Um, we have a lot of people putting their one words in the chat today. So um, if you have a one word uh, that you are working on, feel free to put that in the chat. There's Kevin's is health. Um, mine, was, mine was possibilities. So um, anyway, um, let's see. Uh, Patricia, did you have uh, something else you wanted to share with the group today? Yes, sure. So when we were thinking about student engagement, I was thinking about um, how to keep students engaged as well as their parents. And um, last year we created a teacher and I, because we were kind of brainstorming, um, you know, during remote instruction, um, how can we keep students engaged to completing their assignments? Um, and knowing where their assignments are, being more independent, things like that. So we created a Google Sheet, um, and I will throw that in the chat, that allowed parents and, well, allowed their, the students and their parents to um, complete their, let me share my screen because it's always nice to be able to see the screen while I'm talking about it. Um, here, one moment. And to be able to see uh, what my students are working on per week. And so the first tab talks about um, just what the different completion levels were because we didn't um, keep grades. We wanted to make sure the students were completing work. Um, and then the second tab is just a check-in um, of, you know, are they attending every day? And then here's where the student engagement piece came in. Um, we put in the student, the assignments for the week at the top with links. Um, of course, these aren't linked anymore from, they were from last year. And um, that way when students completed those assignments, then the teacher um, would check off in the box. And as the boxes were checked, the we put some formulas in to change color and the percentiles of um, completed work. So here the teacher would update um, the date and time, note the date and time that they were updated these um, charts because parents were really interested in, you know, my child is telling me they're doing their work at home and it's not looking like it's done here. So we want to know when is it, when was it last updated? And then we had numbers here for students. So students and their parents knew their number and they weren't alphabetical, so they couldn't figure it out. You know, they just were randomly assigned a number. Um, so that was a really nice way of getting um, students engaged, completing their work. They were looking at this, um, this form and the their parents were looking at the form and um, they weren't able to edit it, of course, but they were, they could see that if they needed to, um, if they were missed a day and they were absent or they didn't know where the assignment was or, you know, um, what assignment what was assigned, they could just simply click on the link and get them to the assignment. Of course, they put the assignments too in the Google Classroom as well. But it was a really nice way to have this for parents quickly to look at, to see if the students were engaged and look and also for students to become independent and um, keep themselves accountable as well. And then if you are interested in this, please make a copy. And on the last tab, it just um, explains a little bit of what I did to create those formulas. Wow, that's a lot of information. And Patricia, who doesn't love a good spreadsheet? Are we right there, Emily? This is what I'm saying. I love my spreadsheets. Awesome. <laughs> um, so um, we are about halfway through our time. Guys, you went really, really fast. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Um, 
uh, I, I've thrown a, a, a statement and a question into the chat um, to our participants. If you have any questions, uh, please type those into the chat or into the Q&A. If you have any uh, engagement strategies that you'd like to share, please feel free to drop those in the chat as well. And if anyone has any questions for our three panelists, by all means, please feel free to, um, you can, uh, I tell you what, you can, uh, if you use the hand raise feature at the bottom of your screen in Zoom, um, I can go down and unmute you and allow, and it'll allow you to talk and we can have a little conversation here today. Well, Matt, as we're waiting for a few friends to, to raise their hands and get ready to share, I did have another idea that came to my mind as I was thinking, sorry, no pretty slides, guys, because it just happened. Uh, but uh, in our writing workshop, which as Kevin was sharing, sometimes we have kiddos that are really a little reluctant to do their writing and stuff. I uh, found power in my Bitmoji. And so as my students would be in their Google Doc uh, or in their Google Slides writing, whatever it was, uh, I would kind of throw out a special challenge. And as much as I love spreadsheets, I love a good challenge. So when I would throw out those kids to the throw out the challenge to the kids and say, okay, guys, today for the super secret bonus level, we're going to be looking for, and just made, you know, half of teaching is marketing, right? So marketing this fun thing. And then when they had it, I would just copy and paste a big bit emoji or sticker right on their work. And you could just see their little heads pop up around the room like, oh, I got the sticker. And they'd be so excited and it would keep them going. And then the friends in the classroom who didn't have the sticker yet, all of a sudden they were wanting to get the sticker that uh, others also got in there. So just kind of a neat, fun little way to personalize and have fun with those kiddos. Yeah, That's and great. if you think that it's uh, it's just little kids that like stickers, look at the back of any teacher's laptop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used to put uh, uh, actual stickers on uh, kids' papers. They would peel them off and stick them on their book cover on our yeah. history book, like like fighter pilots chalking up kills. It was it was hilarious to see some of them sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, one thing that um, some teachers struggle with is sometimes I don't have access to things like Bitmojis in my classroom because mm -hmm. if you use Bitmojis, you know, sometimes those aren't always the most appropriate for school. Um, if, if you're in a district like that and you use Google tools, I love that sidebar, uh, Google Keep will mm -hmm. allow you, if you go off premises and say, here are the five or 10 um, digital stickers or digital bitmojis that I want to use in Google Classroom or on a document or something like that. You save those onto a Google Keep sticky. And then when you get back to school again, you will be able to just drag those from that Google Keep note and drop them onto a, the page as a, a JPEG or a PNG. I don't remember how those save, but mm -hmm. um, that's an, a handy way if you don't have access to something like that um, due to filtering policies that you can still use the ones that you decide are appropriate. Yeah, and to add on to that, Matt, you can also, as if you have your iPhone and that's a way that you have it, you can also screenshot it and email it to yourself and be able to copy and paste it from there. Yeah, to kind of get around those. But again, checking to make sure that you use the right bitmojis for the right event. Right, true, true, true. Right. Um, I see I, we're starting to get a little traction there in the chat. So let's take a look. Um, Heather, you say that you're working with, uh, I, I think it's pronounced Gimkit. It's, mm -hmm. it's that one's kind of like um, uh, Kahoot, right? So I don't know, is Heather coming on or are we just? Heather, oh, Heather. Is she there? Hi, Heather. Do you want to share with us a little bit of what, about what you're doing with GimKit? I would, but I currently have COVID and I get oh. coughing fits. Mm -hmm. So oh, okay. if someone wants to explain, I can type, but I can't talk very well. <laughs> No problem, Heather. Well, thanks. And and feel better soon. Oh, I get to go back to school on Thursday, so it's all good. Yay. <laughs> okay. 
So does anyone has, do our panelists have um, uh, GimKit experience to share? I have heard about it and dabbled with it, but not used much of it. Um, but it ties back into Matt and I were talking before the webinar and I told him if I wasn't a classroom teacher, uh, one of my other career choices would be game show host. And I think GimKit uh, fits right in with that. Um, I believe there's just some uh, ways that students can answer questions and then they can earn money and shop at this little store. So it becomes very, uh, engaging because when they do better they win a little bit more and heather if you want to type it for off base on that but uh it looks really awesome and i think even better is that it was created by a high school student who saw a need for wanting some engagement i've used heather it also mentions booklet anyone heard of booklet before it's also very similar to um the way that it works it's, it's very similar to kahoot and gimkit um, they're all very, very fun activity based, um, you know, question and answer for kids to participate in. Okay, uh, let's see, Tori, you have flipping.net or maybe that was a mistype flippity flip. Is that something different or the same? I'm guess. Oh, there she is. Good. Sorry, it was. Um, I okay. mistype. I was driving. I meant flippity. Oh, oh, yeah. Please drive. That's more important. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I'm I'm on my earpods, but uh, okay. yeah. So okay. yeah, I meant flippity.net. I made in. Um, I teach mainly high school, and so I made an Among Us themed board game using flippity.net and images. And so the students can roll the dice and um, they're presented with different challenges. And it's, it's pretty much a teacher led review game, but it's a little bit more updated than, you know, like the Jeopardy style things that, that you would normally see. So I've done that. I do um, for quick formative assessments, I do the conditional formatting and Google Sheets and I, I have the students answer questions and if they get it right, the the colors to the pictures change and it, at the end they have yeah. like a picture of like baby Yoda or whatever. So <laughs> it's kind of a, a quick way to know whether they've gotten the answer correct or not. And they, they like those too. And my biggest thing kind of goes along with what we were saying earlier is choice boards. My, my uh -huh. students love having the choice, even if it's just between one or the other of being able to choose what what product they produce to meet the goal and they they love that i've done you know TikTok style videos and creating your own memes and things like that before as long as i find giving them a choice really helps increase the engagement and also increase the quality of the work that i get as well so yeah and i i see uh uh pixel art with conditional formatting that's a great that's a great tool um i see uh, some other folks are talking about uh kahoot gimkit booklet i'll have to look into booklet that's new to me yeah i really like um tori your comment uh in your in your message that you sent through that said you love google slides but not just for presentations that that comment just hits me right in the right in the feels because <laughs> i love all of the interactive stuff that you can do with Google Slides. You know, even like Patricia was saying earlier with Jamboard, how you can um, you can take a slide just like you can with Jamboard and download it as a picture and put it back in as a background. And you've got, uh, you know, a background for an interactive. You can, I've seen, um, uh, you know, like a, a refrigerator with magnets that you can move around to spell out words and do math problems. Yes. There's so much you can do with Google Slides other than just present. Yeah, and changing the slide size, and you can set the slide background to transparent, the download mm -hmm. transparent pictures on that, so you don't have to take it into background removal tools and all that stuff. That's, mm -hmm. it's really cool, so. Definitely. So I worked with a teacher recently who used, it was doing a, a media literacy class at high school. And one of their goals that they were working on was creating infographics. And they used uh, Google Slides and changed the page size and then input the graphics and the images and text all in there after studying what makes a good infographic. Um, and we see them everywhere and they're all so powerful. So that was a great, those kids really got engaged because 
and because it was relevant. And I think that's another piece of engagement is, you know, what are we finding and putting in to the opportunity students have that is something they would really see. Mm-hmm. Nobody buys 68 oranges. <laughs> Um, when you're talking about uh, the um, something about TikTok and stuff, I I was follow a really cool a Canva educator on TikTok, and he gave um, a an idea about if you uh, type in TikTok video in the search bar in Canva, you can use that um, as a background and then take a picture of yourself remove the background and throw it into that TikTok and then upload it into the social. They have so many great social media um, backgrounds on there. I thought that was kind of cool. Mm. Well, I think that's great to point out too, is that if people weren't aware that Canva is free for educators mm-hmm. on that base level and students, if you you know go through your appropriate uh, SAPA, SOPA compliance and make sure mm-hmm. on all of those things, but um, it is a great design tool for students to be engaged in making those things. Mm-hmm. You know, Emily, and you bring up a good point. Um, do make sure when you're trying out these tech tools, it's very important to have those conversations with your either your school administrator or your IT department, whoever's handling that sort of thing. Uh, make sure that the tools that number one, those administrators are aware of the tools that you are using. And number two, that you can work together to ensure that they're SAPA compliant. Mm -hmm. Um, Kevin mentioned um, anchor.fm, which is something that I absolutely love. Um, I don't see that as being SAPA compliant just yet. So Mm -hmm. we're still looking on on that one. But uh, but do be um, do be aware and keep those lines of communication open here in these uh, in the era of SAPA. <laughs> and to that note, with um, some podcasting stuff, as Kevin was talking, I that's been an area that um, I've worked with a few teachers on and stuff, but we were limited on what was allowed by the district and different things. So sometimes it just takes a little creativity of thinking outside of the box. And one of the ways that uh, we were able to do that was we had students host an empty Google Meet and they put their profile image. They actually created it in slides. They made their uh, podcast logo in slides and they put that image up there and then they recorded the Google Meet to be able to share within their within their classroom on the things that they did. So. Love it. Yeah. Always, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How can you make it happen when it's tricky? And and you know what? Um, th- this may not work on on certain student devices, but um, if you use Zoom on a desktop or laptop, like a a, a PC or a Mac, um, if you install that Zoom client on the device. Um, you can download the the recording. You can record to the uh, to the device, and you can download the recording just the audio only. Mm-hmm. And then, as Kevin mentioned, you could you could post that on Blogger, or you could create a private Google Sites and just allow kids to post. Uh, post those audio recordings right there. So you'd have like a private podcast instead of something that was out there on, you know, iTunes and Amazon and, and Mm -hmm. podcasts. So um, that way you can still get the same uh, experience, but be mindful of student data privacy as well. Yeah. And another, another great tool to use in that way would be uh, Wakelet. You could have the uh, the, the you point. could collect you could collect not only the podcast recordings but you could also um, you can record Flipgrid video right from Wakelet, and you could attach the blogs and you could essentially have a classroom um, collection of all of the podcasts, videos, and blog posts all in one in one place. Yeah, you know you mentioned Flipgrid. Um, some kids don't like being on camera they like uh, or, or they're concerned. <laughs> um, now you don't have to be on camera, which yeah. is great. Um, you can turn that video off and just record the audio. Mm-hmm. Um, another way, if you don't want to do that, a way to jazz it up a little and, and engage is 
simply have kids like they do on the photo booths. Simply have kids make a mask on the back of a paper plate at home with crayons and hold it up in front of their face. That's a simple, simple way to um, kind of encourage that student engagement if they're hesitant. Uh, and I think another think of like your DIY uh, emoji. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. I think another tool too, and I am kind of a I'm a seesaw fan. I'm not gonna not gonna sugarcoat it, but uh, is that if you have the littles and Flipgrid's not quite there with them, Seesaw is a great tool to use to listen to them read or for them to get to share. It's, you know, there's just so much that they can do with it. And I wouldn't always listen to, don't tell my students, but I didn't listen to every single video that they went all the way through on all of them, but it really still allowed them to have that idea of voice and choice of what they were going to tell me if they didn't get time at the teacher table mm -hmm. to tell me we still got to got to connect on that. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Heather. Heather shared a link in the chat for her wax museum that she created. Um, and I just think that's a really fantastic way for uh, another use of Google Slides and those hyperdocs. And Heather actually showed that to me at IETC, but I lost it. So I'm really glad she's here today to reshare that. So. Okay. Um, Folks uh, who are in our webinar today, if you have any questions or if you have any ideas you'd like to share with the rest of our group, or if you want to try to stump the tech coaches here, um, by all means, um, raise your hand in the chat, uh, type it in the Q&A, or um, type it into the chat. Let's uh, pause for a minute or two and give you a chance to kind of breathe. Um, soak in all this information that our tech coaches have shared here and uh, uh, type away for, for just a minute or two. Uh, please uh, visit our website, ltcillinois.org forward slash events forward slash webinars. Uh, and remember the forward slash is the one that lives on the same key as the question mark on your keyboard. Uh, and you can register for any of our free webinars and see all the other events that are going on out in uh, the interwebs uh, in, uh, that the LTC is uh, hosting there as well. Uh, thank you all very much for your time and expertise. And we hope to see you back here again next week uh, to learn a little bit about choice boards with some of our other LTC instructional technology coaches. Emily, Patricia, Kevin, thank you all very much.